Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this year's Gabriel Silver Memorial Lecture. The Silver Lecture series was endowed by a gift from Leo Silver in 1949 in honor of his father, Gabriel, to provide lectures at Columbia uh, on the subject of world peace and international relations. The first le lecture was given by then President of Columbia, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, and the lineup of Silver Lecturers since then um, is long and uh, distinguished, and we are really delighted to add to that roster uh, tonight by welcoming uh, the former Prime Minister of Greece and current uh, SEPA professor, uh, George Papandreou. Mr. Papandreou uh, embodies the qualities that the Silver Lecture uh, and the School of International and Public Affairs promote. He's received numerous honors uh, for a variety of things in the course of a, a distinguished career um, in government and politics in his native Greece, um, and for his work to promote peace and democracy and to fight racism uh, around the world. He uh, has served um, uh, in numerous positions in uh, the Greek government, culminating uh, or, or uh, um, culminating in a, a term as the Prime Minister of Greece uh, from 2009 uh, to November 2011, uh, um, uh, a, an eventful period to be a head of government in Europe. Um, and he was selected uh, in 2010 as one of Foreign Policy Magazine's top 100 global thinkers for, as they put it, making the best of Greece, Greece's worst year. Um, and I think we'll be hearing something about that year and the fallout from it uh, this evening. Um, he's an active, uh, in addition to his activities uh, as, a, as a political and economic reformer in Greece, uh, he's an active supporter of the Information Society and of e-democracy and democratic reforms in Greece. Um, he was selected long before his service as prime minister in 2003 as one of, uh, one of 25 people who are changing the world of internet politics. Um, and uh, he's put some of that innovative thinking to uh, really effective use in Greece and in the Greek uh, government and Greek politics. As foreign minister, before he served as prime minister, he was one of the principal architects of uh, rapprochement between Greece and Turkey, which uh, I understand is quite an accomplishment. Um, in 2000, uh, Mr. Papandreou and his Turkish uh, counterpart, Ismail Cem, were award jointly awarded Statesman of the Year by the East-West Institute for furthering reconciliation, peace, and cooperation um, in the region. In addition to, or uh, on, on, uh, to top off this long and distinguished career in Greek politics and in uh, European affairs, um, he has uh, joined us uh, this semester here at SEPA as an adjunct professor and a SEPA Global Fellow, um, where he has uh, quickly um, become an integral part of the SEPA community um, with students and faculty. Um, and colleagues around the building. Um, as a global public policymaker and as an international thought leader, um, Mr. Papandreou brings a world of experience to SEPA, and I'm delighted to welcome him here to share some of that uh, tonight. His lecture is called Bailouts and Ballots, The New Challenges to Democracy and the Case of Europe. Please join me in welcoming Prime Minister and now Professor George Papandreou. Thank you very much. Dean Lieberman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's truly an honor to speak to such a distinguished audience on the occasion of the Columbia University Silver Lecture. But uh, as I see a good friend, Joe Stiglitz, let me just take one moment to, um, to thank him. During these very critical years, Joe has always been um, not only a close friend, but a person with giving me great support and, of course, his wisdom in dealing with this crisis. The first time I came to Colombia, I was on a mission. My mission was to deliver funds to a Greek student here in Columbia University. We had collected these funds in Canada through our pro-democracy -democ campaign. This was 1972. Greece was under a military dictatorship, and our goal to help the resistance movement and the families of political prisoners in Greece. So I uh, found two Amherst College friends who volunteered to hitchhike with me to New York. We arrived late, around midnight, and took the subway. 
but we got off on the wrong station. I'm not sure that three hippie-ish, long-haired, bearded, white young men were the most welcome sight at Harlem. Harlem was a very different place then. Nevertheless, we safely boarded the next subway and finally accomplished our mission. Before leaving Columbia, I asked a student for a favor. I was an avid guitar player, loved rock music, but I wanted to learn a traditional Greek instrument. I think it was a Cretan lyre, the lyra, as we say, or violin. I said to her, I'd be very grateful if you could bring back an inexpensive Cretan lyra so that I could learn. She wrote to her father-in-law and asked him to look for one. He was summarily taken to the police office for intense interrogation. The interrogators insisted that he reveal what this code was about a Cretan Lyra. <laughs> you see, all mail then was interceded and read by state intelligence agencies. Different times today. Well, today we have our cloud where we actually put all our personal information up there. I do hope now that um, when, after President Obama's proposal for negotiations for liberalizing trade between Europe and the US, that the personal data collection laws in Europe will then be established for the United States also. Because otherwise, it could be that we'll have other types of big brothers. Democracy is never a given. Even today, we must ensure that what new powers, opportunities, wealth, and knowledge that humanity acquires, these not be usurped by the few or unequally distributed. On the contrary, they must empower the many. Empowering our societies is a constant democratic challenge from the ancient times, when the term hubris was coined for exactly the misuse of power. Living through a dictatorship taught me another lesson. Initially, I felt, as many of my generation, that empowerment would come through the gun. Armed guerrilla struggle was the motto of the Panhellenic Liberation Movement of which I was a member. And why not? At 14, I had been held at gunpoint by the junta, threatened to be shot if my father did not surrender to the militia that had come to arrest him. So for us in the resistance, smuggling plastic bombs or guns into Greece was the order of the day. However, at some point, I changed my mind. I decided that the ends do not justify the means. Maybe it was those long, intense debates in a liberal arts college where we were asked to question everything, debating about the Che Guevara's, the Tupamaros, the Gandhi's, the Martin Luther King's, even Mandela's ANC. Or possibly it was my personal experience. Only a year after the military dictatorship took over in Greece, my sister, mother, and I visited my grandfather on his deathbed in Athens. We came from Sweden where we were in exile for our last goodbyes. My grandfather died quietly under house arrest. It was to be a very quiet family funeral at a time when fear and repression reigned, where people were arrested, tortured, if they dared to express their views, much worse if they actually protested. My grandfather's funeral became the first massive democratic protest against the dictatorship. It was a surprise, a revelation for me. It was not weapons, but his quiet suffering that had inspired people to defy the curfew and even possible arrest. Just as a man setting fire to himself in Tunisia touched off the hearts and the minds of an Arab world thirsty for change. A short caveat. I will understand the importance of the Second Amendment. 
But I would say to my American friends, from my experience, M16s cannot defend democracy or empower American society. Democracy must be defended in our consciousness and in our communal practices. This commitment to peaceful cooperation through empowering citizens became the touchstone of my political career. Let me give you an example. In 1999, when I was appointed foreign minister, Greece and Turkey were at loggerheads, almost going to war. I deeply believed that alongside the necessary diplomatic negotiations, success in building a new and peaceful relationship would only come if we could spark the imagination of our peoples. And we could do so by empowering our two societies to be part of this peace process. With my Turkish counterpart, and later, later close friend, Ismail Cem, his daughter is very active in the Global Center for Colombia in Istanbul, we worked together on what we called people's diplomacy. It was not an elite project. Hundreds, then tens of thousands of citizens from football leagues to business leaders, from joint cookbooks to music concerts, welded a new understanding. So a renewed hope that we could coexist peacefully in a wider European family of common values was developing. That's the relevance of Europe, which can be more relevant than ever as a force of peace and democracy beyond borders, beyond nationalisms, empowering societies, citizens, from the Arab Spring to the Middle East, from the Balkans to the Caucasus. A unique experiment in cooperation beyond nations to empower our societies as we are moving into a time of globalization and global challenges. And challenged Greece was, as I also was a prime minister, in the post-2008 world of bonds, global finance, market speculation, or outright market fears. In 2011, I had negotiated the biggest haircut in recent history. Haircut meaning debt relief of around 100 billion euros. And a new support program of loans to carry us over. Of course, this would also mean we continued difficult cuts, consolidating our budget, but more than that, to push reforms, further reforms in our country. Fighting vested interests, oligarchs, tax evasion, corruption, fighting for transparency and equity. A political system that empowered our citizens who had been tired of the dependencies of state clientelism and crony capitalism. I went to Cannes, where the G20 was meeting, to defend my position. I heard much criticism from European partners. They were afraid of the turmoil a referendum would create in the markets. I replied, we can only ensure confidence in the markets when we first have assured the confidence of our people. I think, however, I also had upset the G20 festivities the French president had then been preparing. But as you know, the G20 is called by many the G0, so maybe a little excitement was needed. I'm quite sure we would have won this referendum. Nevertheless, nevertheless, what I did accomplish was to create a wide consensus that had been lacking up to that point amongst the political parties. But why would Greece and Europe muddle through, a tight rope, muddle through on a tightrope, veering on the edge of instability and turbulence in the bond markets for these last years? I think the lesson is simple. We acted more like local leaders playing to our constituencies' fears rather than leaning towards a stronger union. Despite the appreciated financial help to Greece, we, active, we acted divisively rather than in a united way. We did not act as Europeans. So my quick conclusion would be we need to revisit our fundamentals in Europe. But bear with me and let me describe three myths 
we Greeks like our myths, but uh, these were not Greek myths, actually. <laughs> Wrong political narratives around the Greek crisis that deterred us from diagnosing the problem and taking united and effective action. Narratives and myths that have torn at the fundamentals of this European Union and disempowered our societies as well. The first myth, myth was that we needed, all we needed was austerity, much less reform. When I attended my first European Council as Prime Minister, I had revealed the true extent of Greece's deficit. We were all shocked by the numbers. Some suggested deep and immediate austerity measures. I countered by saying that the deficit was only the tip of the iceberg. We needed to consolidate our budget, but prioritize the deeper problems Greece was facing. Even the fact that the Greek statistical agency had reported a 6% deficit only three days before the elections, rather than the 12%, and in the end it went up to 15.8%, only underlined the institutional problems Greece was facing. One of our first changes, of course, was to establish an independent statistical agency. So Greece was a mismanaged country and economy. One that, having been on the winning side of the Cold War, was not asked to undergo real change, despite the fact that we had only recently emerged from a dictatorship. Nor was this welfare profligacy, as many believe, even now in the US, I hear Republicans cite Greece as a profligate welfare state. Well, a Brookings Institute, the Brookings Institute makes a different comparison. In a recent study, I found it found that if Greece were as transparent as the Nordic welfare states, we would immediately save 8% of GDP. So what Greece needed was not excessive austerity, but a revolution. And I mean that, that in a sense that the modern Greek philosopher Cornelius Castoriadis defined it. He said, revolution means neither bloodshed nor storming the winter palaces. Revolution means a radical transformation of society's institutions. So this is exactly what my government set out to do. I needed to use my political capital and fresh mandate for change. The revolution of the self-evident, as we called it. But this meant time. Unluckily, when the market started to pressure Europe and pressure Greece, Europe decided not to support these priorities and moved into a more orthodox formula of austerity rather than deep reform. A second myth was that this was no European problem. This was a Greek problem. And around the world, we found out that uh, there were many experts we had never heard about that uh, knew about the Greek problem. Uh, was, Greek really, was Greece really the problem? A country of 2.5% approximately of the GDP of Europe? Media, even serious politicians, talked about the lazy Greeks. Yes, wouldn't it be convenient if the problem was Zorba dancing and Uzo drinking? I think we would have found an easy solution. We were the pigs. I'm always saying I'm proud to be a pig. That's a Portuguese, Italian, Irish, Greek, and Spaniard, as I'm proud to be a European. But this became a narrative about lazy Southerners who should be punished for their profligacy. Never mind that Spain had low debt and deficit figures before the crisis began. Or according to OECD figures, we in Greece work the longest hours in the European Union. But someone had to take the blame for this failure, and it was very convenient to Hellenize the problem. My motto was, Greece has a problem, but Greece is not the problem. This was a wider European problem, and we needed to unite in action rather than call each other names. But this demanded bold decisions. Decisions on the flawed structure of the Eurozone, the lack of oversight and monitoring by the Commission, the policies of the ECB and a single-mindedness on inflation, 
the imbalances of surplus and deficit economies in a common currency union, the deeper reasons for Europe's recession and loss of competitiveness to the emerging economies such as the lack of growth or a green growth policy, the wider financial imbalances and inequalities such as tax evasion through tax havens and offshore companies. Let's hope that the G20 will do something about that. The fears a European and global banking system had after the Wall Street debacle that meant that little investment went into the real economy. Most banks were looking at their accounting books. The insecurity we created in the markets by doing too little too late, or the constant talk about a Grexit or an exit of Greece from the Euro. Ignoring these issues ensured that they would return to haunt us, and they did. Not dealing with these issues created mistrust in our own project and had the opposite effect in the markets, such as contagion and further recession. Per Steinbrück, former finance minister of Germany and candidate for chancellor in the upcoming elections in Germany, recently said, had we guaranteed Greek bonds in 2010, we would have avoided both contagion and the major costs of austerity and loans from creditor country, countries. Had we pooled our resources and strengths, the crisis would have been over. He is right. That would have been a true European response. But the political discourse turned nasty. Prejudice, xenophobia, even outright racism. A third myth had been that Greece had not lived up to its commitments. Despite difficulties, even mistakes, we have had unprecedented results. Through impressive sacrifices by the Greek people and a strong political drive for reform, much has been accomplished under our support mechanism. We reduced our deficit by 6.5% in just two years. If that was the US budget, it would be about $1 trillion, or the totality of the defense and the education budget together. Leaving aside interest payments, in 2013, the Greek government will take in more money than it spends, achieving the so-called primary surplus. We removed restrictions to competition in over 150 regulated professions. Greece is now one of the World Bank top movers in business friendliness. I myself put all expenditures online to fight corruption and waste. We revamped the tax laws and are fighting tax evasion in and outside of Greece. We reformed the pension system, the higher education system, consolidated local government from 57 to 13 regions. Overall, we were the number one OECD reformer from 2008 to 2011. And this has led to real adjustment. Greece has regained half of the competitiveness lost since joining the euro. Greek exports have surged. Our current account deficit is now at its lowest level since we joined the euro. But the reality was that the wider European problems continued to undermine market confidence. Like Odysseus, uh, we were tied to the European mast. But when a storm came, we were the first to be hit. This led to a vicious circle of recession. It led to real pain. Greece is now in its fifth year of recession. Unemployment is at 20%, and the Greek economy has shrunk by almost a quarter. A year into the program, the so-called Troika realized that we would not access the bond markets in 2012. Was Greece to blame? Many did so. But actually, markets doubted Europe's resolve to deal with the wider Eurozone crisis. I have enormous faith in Greece's capabilities, its human potential, its comparative advantages for green energy, agriculture, fisheries, tourism, its culture, its history, its possibilities in wellness services and education. But we demand understanding, understanding of the real problems Greece faces, and above all, respect, respect for the difficult adjustments we are making. Hope and solidarity to a proud people who have lived through wars, defense budgets that have cost us dearly, dictatorships and dependencies, and now a people that is fighting for its dignity. Nothing more, but nothing less. Today's politics is often reduced to polls, media, and money. What we really need 
is a politics of trust. Faith in our people's capacities by supporting institutions and democratic practices that guarantee solidarity, education, understanding, transparency, good governance, and participation. In Europe, we need to bring back this spirit, and I would propose a new grand bargain, if you like. First of all, we must stop this racist scapegoating rhetoric, southerners to the northerners, northerners to the southerners, or whatever, which is undermining everything the European Union stands for. Second, we need a real green growth strategy, investing in infrastructure, renewable energy, and education, developing own resources through such tools as the financial transaction tax or a CO2 tax. I speak of green growth because it is the only sustainable investment that will guarantee our future competitiveness. Third, we need a cohesion policy for the unemployed. In Greece, youth unemployment is a staggering 62%. In Germany, it's at record lows. Yet for a variety of cultural and economic reasons, labor mobility is stubbornly low across European single market. Let us create a scholarship fund for the unemployed to train in whatever country they wish. An Erasmus program for the unemployed, for those who are European here. We also need further integration, fiscal, economic, even democratic, such as an elected European president. Finally, we need to rethink how we deal with the debt in countries in, adjust in adjustment programs. Recession and policy missteps in Europe might point to an even grander bargain on the horizon. Deep reform for debt forgiveness. And this may need to be ratified through referenda, a bargain guaranteed by our peoples. The rise of extremism, such as that we are witnessing in Greek society today, is, I believe, a result of a sense of civic disempowerment, a feeling that we have little power to change, affect our fate. So we look for saviors, scapegoats, even resort to violence. The antidote must be more democracy empowering our peoples. I propose this as I believe we often underestimate the power of our collective action. Whether it is our potential of our societies or the capability to work together democratically even beyond borders in Europe and the world. Europe is just such a democratic experiment on global democratic gov governance where different cultures Nations, peoples, languages work together to deal with the challenges that often overwhelm our national institutions. As we deal with even more complex problems around the world, Europe needs to reinvent itself by revisiting these fundamental values. Despite our problems, I remain an optimist. Over the past years, much has changed in Europe. Some may call the glass half empty, others half full. But you may see that we pigs seem to be doing better on the markets. But we need to bring back this European spirit. This unique experiment must succeed. And I believe either we Europeanize our global economies, that is, humanize globalization, or we will witness the dehumanization of Europe and our Western societies. I must again be, it must again become an example to the world and live up to the expectations of a Nobel Prize winner going beyond nationalism so that we accept, even revel in, our diversities as a source of learning, creativity, and inspiration. The politics and media of today need to be able to promote inquiry over inquisition, critical analysis over dogmatic belief, questioning over absolutisms, dialogue over fundamentalisms, cooperation over polarization, thought over fear, solidarity over prejudice. We need to develop a global culture of humanism, or as Aristotle might put it, a society to the human measure. This is not simply a European challenge. These are global challenges. And I know here in Colombia, the diversity of your student body, the global reach of your activity, the spirit of a different, tolerant, critical thinking leadership 
is alive and well. So I am here, this time on a different mission, or maybe it's a similar one, again, fighting for democracy. So it's my honor that I have been welcomed in your community of values. Thank you very much. All right, well, um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister Papandreou, for a wonderful uh, uh, insight into uh, some of the challenges of the European crisis of the last few years. Um, we're going to take a few questions, and I'm going uh, to start off with a question, but I'll invite um, people from the audience who would like to ask a question to uh, begin to line up behind. There's a microphone in the center aisle. Um, and we have uh, maybe 20 minutes or so for people who want to who want to ask questions. Um, but what 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 struck me particularly about your uh, description of the course that Greece followed during the crisis is that what is presented so often as primarily an economic crisis, a bond crisis, uh, a deficit crisis, um, was really a political crisis. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, our. There's a famous uh, quote. Um, from Rahm Emanuel, who was uh, President Obama's first chief of staff, um, as Obama was about to take office uh, uh, in, in the middle of the crisis, that um, no opportunity should, no crisis should be uh, should be put to uh, waste. Every crisis is an opportunity. Um, so it seems that the, the economic crisis provided both a political opportunity for you and for Greece and for other countries in Europe, but also the economic crisis imposed constraints on what you were able to do both in Greece and in Europe politically. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the sort of connections between economic crisis and political opportunity uh, that you faced. Well, thank you, Bob. First of all, I was elected on a mandate of change. As a matter of fact, the slogan was either we change or we sink, which rhymes in Greek. Uh, so we knew that there was, need, there was a need for, for deeper changes. Uh, we were hit with this deficit, and of course, the the question was then, how do you deal with this? I saw this as an opportunity to say to the Greek people, but also say to our European partners, okay, this is a chance for really cleaning up our act. And when I meant that, I meant reorganizing our state. I have a bit of a thesis of that, that uh, looking at the type of the countries that are now in adjustment programs or are under difficulties are countries that came into the European Union uh, after the Cold War or even during the Cold War but after dictatorships or highly clientelistic uh, societies such as in Italy, Luigi Gingales talks about Italy uh, very, very vividly, and we didn't really go through our glasnost or perestroikas. Uh, not that the glasnost and perestroikas were always successful, but anyway, they, we didn't go through a deeper reform uh, of the political and, uh, and, uh, and administrative institutions. I felt, and I still feel, that this was a chance for making major, major changes. Uh, I'll just give you an example, which I've used in my class, and, and uh, um, just to show that this was not just an austerity question. Uh, when uh, we knew that there was um, uh, some collusion between doctors and big multinational pharmaceuticals, and uh, computerizing prescriptions would have helped deal with this, so I pushed this. Um, and uh, pushed it very hard. And finally, we got a group of civil servants on their own. They worked the software program. I called in the ministers responsible, and they said, we have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, the doctors are saying that uh, they, they don't know how to use computers. <laughs> so we then decided that um, any doctor that couldn't use a computer, we would sever his or her contract. In two weeks, 95% of the doctors learned to use a computer. <laughs> but what we did is we saved 30% on prescriptions, 30%. Now, that is not cutting wages and pensions. That is reorganizing a system which has waste, even corruption. So that's what I was always saying, give us the time to make these changes. It's an opportunity. But what happens then is then the, when the markets really started pushing, uh, the orthodox belief that simply cutting uh, would, would do it. And of course, uh, if we had to cut very fast, then the, only, the easiest way to cut was to cut 
uh, wages and pensions and, 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 uh, rather than to wait for the reforms to take place. Uh, now, had the European Union also been more uh, ready to do things like euro bonds or, or guarantee uh, the, in the markets that these bonds that we were having could be, would be um, safe bonds, we would then have greater time than having to push uh, uh, very quickly for austerity to repay this debt and the deficit and cut down the deficit very quickly. So I think there was, a, there was a balance there. So it ended up, what I feel was, we had too much emphasis in the end on austerity. Uh, and you need, you, you, you need to use this as an opportunity, but it, the, 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 the pain can be too much, and then you can break the back of, of people. And I think what's happened now is that people still believe that there's an opportunity, but there's also been a lot of pain, and that's what we have this extremist development in some of the uh, quarters of Greek society. Thanks. Please. Hi. Um, good evening, sir. Um, thank you for, uh, for your talk, and thank you for, for fighting that um, neo-Nazi rhetoric of calling us. I'm also a pig. I'm a Spaniard. Lazy and all of that. Um, you mentioned the the referendum you were going to call for on um, October 31st, uh, 2011. And 11 days after that, you resigned and you called off the referendum. You've also talked to us about transparency tonight. Uh, could you please tell us what happened in between? Who called you? What sort of pressures you received? <laughs> and yeah, I mean, it, I think we could sure. really use that. And just one other thing. I'm, I'm also, like I said, I'm a young European. Um, and I see all throughout my continent um, governments doing the opposite of what they were elected for to already in my country. Uh, other governments who dare to challenge the markets um, being pushed out of office like, like yourself and, and being replaced by technocrats mainly coming from one specific investment bank. Um, so I wonder... Could you please convince me that as a European, I, I was born and I, I live, or when I go back home, live in a democratic society and not a financial dictatorship, please? Thank you. I'm not the right person to convince you that, but um, <laughs> because I have, my, I have my, um, my criticisms about the financial, uh, the financial world also. Uh, and uh, you know how we were quick on saving the banks, but uh, very mistrustful in in in, in uh, uh, trying to help countries uh, get out of this conundrum. Uh, we, um, uh, I think, some felt that at some point the market pressures on on, on these countries like Spain or, or Greece were a blessing in disguise. And now I'm not saying that this wasn't an opportunity also to make changes. But if you let market forces go wild, uh, then you have a crisis, and that's what happened in, in Europe. Uh, you can't really control it. Fear took over markets. Speculation took over markets. Um, all kinds of, uh, of... And if you think that these markets... I mean, the, 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 the types of monies that are around, the hedge funds and so on, together may have more than what we have as budgets. Uh, the CDS, when I, what I've heard, the CDS is play, being played in, in, or being transferred uh, across, the, uh, across the table uh, could allot to uh, something like 600 trillion. So we're talking about uh, numbers that go way beyond what our national governments ever handle and, and, the, and the power we and even elected officials uh, can do. And I think that's one of the frustrations of politics today. That, uh, and I think the younger generation sees that we have great capacity as humanity. We can you know, solve you know, the slogan, we can solve poverty, we can, sol we can make poverty history. Uh, and we can deal with climate change. We could have deal dealt with this financial crisis much, much earlier. But I think there is a concentration of power, as you mentioned, uh, which uh, has, uh, has strong, has captured politics in different countries, whether it's lobbies, or the, whether it's um, outright um, uh, corruption, uh, and uh, which um, also shows that at the national level we cannot solve our problems alone. These are questions which go way beyond our national politics. So when you vote for a politician, sometimes even the best of politicians, the most honest of politicians, 
have difficulty if we don't work together to deal with these issues. So let's say like tax evasion. Greece has a great problem of tax evasion. It's not simply an internal problem. It's the fact that banks actually help people take their money out to other banks and to tax havens. Well, if we don't deal with that, the Cayman Islands and the whatever other uh, offshores, you know, these are robbing revenues of our peoples. So yes, we have major changes to make. But I think that Europe can do that. But it, would be, it has to be a slightly different Europe, which I believe in. Please. Hi. Um, and again, uh, thank you. And I, I appreciate your answer to, this, to the previous question. And I'm going to continue along the same line. And, and, and you have the, um, the theme of, of uh, ballots and bailouts. And as I was coming here, I was wondering where you were going to put donations in that system. And, and, and looking at the global financial crisis and, uh, and to the degree it, it started in the United States, one factor was donations leading to deregulation of banks, leading to questionable behavior, leading to the need for bailouts, leading to contagion all over the world, and resulting in pressures put on countries uh, who became in trouble because of the, the total uh, financial crisis worldwide, and then the demands for austerity when the initial problem was the deregulation of the financial institutions, many of whom are demanding the austerity now. And, and I'm wondering how you see the the democratic system and its uh, depend, current dependence on, on donations uh, uh, is something that can be really reformed before we can start to have policies that, that regulate in a meaningful way so that banks do not uh, behave in a way that, that harms the, the nations and the world. So I, I just would like a comment, uh, uh, if you can uh, give one. Thank you. Well, I think this is, that's a very important point. Um, obviously, Dean Lieberman, of, of, uh, who is a great uh, historian on, on US politics, can tell you more about the donation system here in the, the US. But, but I would, money in politics is a major problem. Uh, and and uh, sometimes politics, politics can be captured in legal ways, like lobbies. But basically, you are beholden to, to, uh, to these big interests. Uh, and um, the amount of money needed uh, to be able to be elected uh, in, in a democratic system is astounding. And it's undermining our democratic system. I know Joe Stiglitz has written about the consequences of this inequality, these income inequalities, how they then reflect on uh, on, the, um, on the political system, how the political system is then captured. So in fact, when going back to the, to the referendum, I, I had hoped that I would be able to get around because you know, there was a lot, political parties, uh, interests, even bankers, media moguls and behind them, oligarchs sometimes, who certainly didn't want reform in Greece. And I felt that, that this referendum would have been a way to give empower the people so they would own this project and they would and and and, and they the, the you know they, they couldn't be influenced one way or another i mean they would be influenced uh but they would be their decision and they could they could, wouldn't have these go-betweens if you like that sometimes um whether it be media or even some of the some of the opposition leaders that were very much against any kind of uh, movement and change but um and luckily what happened then of course was that um a view in in europe uh, not all I did have support from a number of leaders, um, but there is a view uh, in, in Europe that Europe is an elite project, and it's not really wise to ask the people too often. Uh, I disagree with that, because I think that the European project, if it is to survive, at some point has to become a people's project. And the referenda are not silver bullets, but it's one way. 
Thanks. Why don't we take, why don't we start collecting a few questions? So why don't we take two questions and then we'll okay. come back to George sure. and then two more. So please go ahead. Uh, hello, I'm a, I'm a fellow Greek and uh, I think everybody here is treating you much too well. I think that everybody seems to agree with you and I'm kind of puzzled by, by that. Um, I think you, you, you almost present yourself as somebody who's, you are part of a Greek dynasty. Your grandfather was prime minister, your father was prime minister, then you became prime minister. And you only talk about the reform after 2008. But something went terribly wrong in Greece during maybe from 74 to 2008. Uh, maybe we work very hard, long hours, but we're very unproductive. Um, the private sector sort of declined over a long period of time. The public sector came and offered all these jobs and bankrupted the country. And you sort of want to Europeanize the problem. But can't you tell us sort of a little bit of a mea culpa first in saying we really screwed up? I mean, as a Greek, I feel like I'm almost ashamed of what happened. And you're there and saying you talk about collaboration versus blah, blah, blah. I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of empty rhetoric. I think from 08, maybe you did very good work, but we did something terribly wrong. And just talk about Northern Europe and Southern Europe, it's true, it's different, there's different cultures. I think your doctors, our doctors, are always gaming the system, but I think if you go to Germany, or if you go to Denmark, they are not. They'll say, I'll prescribe the generic drug because it's cheaper, whereas the Greek guy does the other way. So we did something very wrong. We all took advantage of this sort of democracy, and you okay. should acknowledge Thank it. you very much. I think, I think we'll let you respond to that before we move on. Okay, thank you. No, first of all, I, I, I don't disagree with you that uh, we did screw up in, in Greece at different times. And, uh, and that's what I said in the begin beginning. I said this was not that we actually just overspent. You know, we didn't, it was, I, I lived in Sweden, as, as I mentioned. You know, we didn't overspend in, let's say, childcare, like maybe in, in Sweden they might <coughs> overspend in childcare and then have to cut the budget. We were, there was a lot of waste. And there was a lot of corruption. And I said this. And I've been accused, uh, even in Greece, by saying that, there's been corruption in Greece. But I said that because I want to change it. That's why I said it. I didn't want to hide it. And I don't think we could, uh, even if somebody wanted to. But there are ways of changing it. I said one way was, I showed, you know, one was you know, the computerization of, of the prescriptions. The other was, you know, they're just putting everything online, all the expenditures online, e-procurements. Um, even our laws, we would have a sort of a wiki procedure of deliberation. These were reforms we started, or the way we picked people for the public sector. Absolute meritocracy, even at the political level, for the first time, and this was around the world, a, a, a first, we had a, an open uh, um, announcement for people to come in for highly political positions. We had, for 88 positions, we had 28,000 applications. Usually just the party comes in, puts in the, their party people. So we really started making changes. What I'm unhappy about is that the austerity has, in a sense, uh, been the real pain, and this has slowed down the reforms. I was talking to Gerhard Schroeder, the former chancellor of Germany, and he said to me, he said, and he said this publicly also, he said he could not have done both reform and austerity at the same time. We were asked to do both. So we do have our responsibilities. I don't say that. However, there are other responsibilities, too, inside the European Union, which are structural. I would say that the fact that we came into the European Union, we came into the Euro, we were given subsidies uh, over these years, we didn't look at some of the major problems we had in our economy. Our agriculture should be the most competitive in the world. This Mediterranean diet is a brand name. Yet, we got subsidies to throw away our produce. Now, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's a Greek problem, but it's also a European problem. Now, um, so yes, we need, we, need to, we need to live up to the reforms, and, and the Greek people all need to, each one, each one of us in, in, in his or her way, needs to take responsibility for moving the country forward. 
it's easy to scapegoat. It's easy to see you know, the outside to say, oh, the Germans or the IMF and so on. I said one time to my, in, in the parliament, I said, well, if it's the IMF that's a problem, why don't we just throw them into the Aegean and uh, our problems will be solved. So it's easy to scapegoat. But we do have to see the European problems too. Just one thing on the dynasty. Uh, I've heard this, and thank you for the question. Um, first of all, dynasties usually are not elected. Um, I've been elected always in my life, democratically. I fought in my party to make changes also. I said, when I was up for election uh, as leader of my party, I said, I will not run unless we change the constitution of the party and make it an open primary. One million people came to vote in, in a country of, 10, of 11 million. I was elected twice and with, this, with this process. But also, just looking back, um, you know, there are, there are families and families. Just so happened my grandfather in his life was exiled six times or, or jailed six times in his life fighting for democracy. He was going to be executed in the 20s, he was lucky to, to live, uh, because of his democratic views. My father also, twice uh, in his life. So, it's a fight for democracy. It's not really a, a royal dynasty. Thanks. All right, now let's begin to collect a couple of questions. So please be brief and concise. Go ahead. Thank you very much for being here tonight, Mr. Papandreou. Um, I was wondering, you spoke of civil unrest in Greece, and you spoke of uh, everybody in Greece having their own responsibilities of what's going on right now. Uh, but I was wondering to which extent you believe that this unrest is due to the fact that right now for young people, the minimum wage is in Greece is 510 euros, and for elected members of the parliament, the, wage, the monthly wage is 8,000 euros. And there is, while people in the private sector keep getting fired, there is no way you can fire anybody in the public sector. So I was wondering if you could talk to that. All right, thanks. One more. Hi, my name is Melvina Kafalas. I am a uh, junior at Barnard, um, and I don't know if you know, but um, Barnard has an Athena Center for Leadership Studies, and one of the things that the center does is host global symposia around the world once a year, um, looking at the role of women in certain areas. So this year it's Brazil, um, in the past it's been Africa, um, and I'm concerned with the question of women in Greece. So um, I think economic upheaval presents an unique opportunity to kind of reimagine society. And I think what you were speaking about largely shows that we can reimagine society and that Greece has been somewhat reimagined in um, the recent past. But yet men are dominating the political airwaves right now. And when you turn on the TV and you see men speaking about politics, it kind of, um, and about the economic climate, um, it leaves us to wonder where are, where are the women, you know, and what is the role of women in this um, equation and how is the economic crisis affecting women's lives? So um, I was wondering if you could speak to that and how women are uniquely positioned to kind of do this reimagining that your party is um, championing. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. You wanna, you wanna take those? Well, beginning from the second question that'll come to the first. Um, Actually, uh, the party that um, I, I am a member of in the 80s made major reforms for women. Uh, we had one of the most progressive laws uh, around the world, actually, and the UN recognized it. Um, civil marriage, women could keep their name. We didn't have the dowry, which was then uh, abortion. Um, also, certain benefits for leave. Uh, as a party leader, I, I ensured quotas, that we had gender quotas. Uh, there was at least one-third uh, women. Usually, I mean, it would, could be one-third men, too, but uh, usually there was women that were out of it. And I put quotas for migrants also in the party at all levels. Uh, it was the first time we had one-third ministers in my, in my um, cabinet, and on the European Parliament list, it was 50-50. So I very much believe in, 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 in women power, if you like, or, or the, uh, the liberation or the, the emancipation or the empowering of women, because I think this is uh, not only right, but it also is very important for our societies. And if we uh, look around the world, uh, I think this is a, a movement that will 
really be important for democracy in many countries, whether we're talking about the Arab world, but not only. Uh, I, I recently wrote an article with um, the head of the Socialist International Women. I happen to be the head of the Socialist International where we, fought, we wrote an article about violence against women and how we should have a campaign after what happened in India, what happened in Afghanistan. We should have a major campaign around the world to, to support uh, uh, all kinds of not legal and practical measures to stop violence against women. On the other issue, I, I understand very much that the symbolism of, of uh, if you like, a Gandhian symbolism, that, that first the change must be us. And as a matter of fact, we did begin from the government by making changes and with the cars we used, the, 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 the secret service people that, and, 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 and uh, that usually were thousands and, and for different deputies and so on, or hundreds anyway. We cut this down. Uh, we actually cut salaries, uh, 40% uh, of, of parliamentarians. Uh, and we cut uh, pensions. Uh, my pension will be cut uh, when I get pension, will be cut by 65%. I'll be getting 1,700 euros per month uh, as a former prime minister. So I think these are important symbolic acts. Uh, these, are, um, these are something which sometimes in populist press are not known, are not seen. Uh, and, uh, but that doesn't mean that there still isn't suffering in the country. I mean, I don't think that no, no matter how much symbolism you have, uh, I think that there is suffering in the country. But I would, I would target less the deputies and the Congress, the people in Congress who are, in fact, elected and you can kick them out by not electing them again. Uh, but the major tax evaders where we are fighting to bring in a sense of justice, but that takes a lot of work from all of us in, in uh, making sure that the tax system does work. All right, thanks. We'll take the last two questions and then uh, give uh, the Prime Minister the last word. Thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Papandreou, uh, you spoke a bit about the violence that is happening in Greece and your personal journey on that issue. And, uh, but you also mentioned that this violence is coming from different quarters in Greek society. And I, I wondered if you, um, if, if you uh, would say that you could uh, equate you know, the violence that is coming from the extreme right, which is, which is the Golden Dawn and uh, the, the left or the extreme left. I mean, it's a, big, it's a big, big issue in Greek society, and I think also a historian here at Columbia has faded in on this issue. Thank you. Thanks. And the final question. Hi, hello. I actually would like to know if, um, if you were back in your late 20s, what would you do? So like, I share most of your dreams, ideals, uh, this fascination for the European spirit, but I'm turning very pessimistic when I see this huge human capital being sacrificed and um, how politics may seem like to do a lot of great speeches, just like yours today, but in action. Um, well, we have Francois Hollande, who got elected in my home country last year. Who? Uh, Francois Hollande. Francois Hollande. Okay. Uh, it's a great speech, is, you know, this idea of change, but in, in action, I'm, I'm getting a bit skeptic. So what would you do if you were in your late 20s? Thank you. <laughs> Good question. Good question. Uh, I think that this, this generation in Greece and uh, in southern Europe is, uh, is, in, is in deep peril, if you like, uh, of being what people call the lost generation because of the high unemployment. So, um, and that, that we have to deal with. So proposals like, as I said, the growth investment, investing in, 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 uh, in a Europe which uh, we, we could easily, I believe, stimulate, maybe not at the Keynesian level, at, at, at Keynes at the, at the national level, but at, at a European level, why not? Why not create euro bonds to invest and leverage private monies, private funds, for, let's say, transportation infrastructure, communication infrastructure, energy grids, green energy grids, innovation and education, to make, first of all, a single market. Europe may be united politically, but if you think of Europe, east, west, north and south, our infrastructure is still pretty much a Cold War infrastructure. We don't have this, this communication, so let's create a single market. Uh, and through that, let's create jobs and at the same time make Europe much more competitive uh, in a world uh, where I think we will have to compete on our 
quality products and not simply by trying to cut wages uh, and uh, uh, a race to the bottom, as, as they say. It should be a race to the top. And if you want my view, in, uh, in organizations such as the ILO or the WTO, we should fight for labor standards in the emerging markets. We should fight for environmental standards. We should want to see a race to the top, which will leaven the, uh, level out the playing field, but also help much of the monies that are circulating in the stratosphere of, uh, of globalized tax havens go back to the actual producers and workers around the world. Um, so, but I would say also that, that uh, what a younger generation, if I was in late 20s, uh, nice to be if I was, <laughs> but um, uh, even in a difficult time, I would, I would organize, I would organize politically, but not simply to demonstrate and protest. That would be part of it, of course. But I would organize politically to see how I would reorganize my economy, how I would take initiatives, how I would fight for a more just society, how I would use crowdsourcing, how I would use the new tools for innovation, uh, uh, how I would use the new tools for change beyond borders, how I would create more solidarity between Greeks, Germans, Spaniards, French, others, uh, to create a real European consciousness around what needs to be changed in, uh, in Europe. And I think this is, uh, you know, I've, I've, I'm all for, uh, and I very much understand, even when I was prime minister, the many people who were protesting and hurting. But I always said, you know, if it's only protesting, it's not going to go very far. Uh, if you also take initiative, make constructive change in our society, then we can build our comparative advantages. We can change our societies. We can make them much better. Uh, finally, on violence. I, 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 for me, I, I mean, I'm a left-winger, and I, and I was left-winger when we were fighting for democracy in, um, in Greece. But I came to the belief that there's, you know, there's no color to violence. Um, left or right wing, you can baptize it what you like. I think that violence then begets violence. I, I, I really felt when, when during the dictatorship, but looking at other movements too, that, or looking at other conflicts. Um, I've talked to the, to, to, I've talked to the Fatah, I've talked to the Palestinians, I've talked to Hamas about this issue. They are now moving to nonviolence. Even Hamas is moving to nonviolence uh, in, around the Middle East conflict. There must be a reason. And I think the reason is that uh, if you want change, you have to touch the hearts and the minds of the people. It's not imposing. It's not creating fear. It's not through the gun. It's through genuinely inspiring change inside ourselves and working for it. And that we can't do through violence. We can only do through deliberation, dialogue. Actually, what you hear you represent. <coughs> Liberal arts, the idea of thinking critically and being able to decide and participate in a nonviolent and peaceful way. Well, I think you can see why, uh, in a short time, um, uh, George has endeared himself to the SEPA community there. I can't think of a better uh, manifesto for what uh, the school stands for and what we try to instill in our students and in the community. So with that, um, I'd like to invite everyone to join us upstairs on the sixth floor for uh, a brief reception. Um, so you'll get a chance to greet Mr. Papandreou. Um, there are stairs, so you don't crowd the elevator. Um, but please join me in uh, thanking George Papandreou for a fantastic evening.